Hello, my beautiful friend. It's Christy here. Just quickly wanted to pop on here and let you know that my book, Love Life Sober, A 40-Day Alcohol Fast, is now available for pre-order. I will stick a link for you in the show notes. But if you want to head to lovelifesober40dayfast.com, you can get it there on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, pretty much everywhere. I've also lined up some really special pre-order goodies for the gals that get the book early. So make sure you pop over there to check them out. I'm really, really thrilled to share this with you and I cannot wait for you to read it. Thanks. Welcome to But Jesus Drink Wine and other stories that kept us stuck. I'm Mead. And I'm Christy. And in this podcast, we'll explore the stories that kept us, well, stuck, wanting to drink and not wanting to drink all at the same time. Join us as we show you that freedom from alcohol does not have to mean a life sentence of misery and missing out, but actually means living an authentic life full of peace, joy, and purpose. Hello, friends. How are you? Yay! We have Christy Bulwer back in the studio. Yay! Okay, in case... You've been living under a rock and you haven't heard us talk about Christy in the community or on the pod. Christy Bulwer suffered a nervous... I feel like I shouldn't be like laughing when I'm talking about your nervous breakdown. Sorry. Christy Bulwer suffered a nervous breakdown caused by severe panic and anxiety in 2011. Her pain turned into purpose and she founded Fearless Unite, a nonprofit organization. She is an international speaker, author of the amazing book, Nervous Breakthrough which is relaunching with audiobook June 25th. She is a Bible study creator and awesome leader. Her biggest passion in life is to see men and women of all ages overcome fear and anxiety by stepping into their God-given purpose and identity. She's happily married to the love of her life, Troy, and they have three beautiful kiddos. Welcome back, Christy. Yay! Friends, I'm so grateful. Actually, I think I'm going to call you babes. babes. Okay. Yes. Thank you for having me back, yes. babes. <laughs> Can we just pause for a quick second and talk about her masterclass in the community? Oh, oh my and gosh. how everyone's. Yes. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Our community girls are still talking about that. Like, it was such. So, yeah. Anytime that we get to be with you, Christy, is such a blessing. So, mm. thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for that sweet encouragement. But honestly, thank you for what you're doing in those master. I mean, I could tell. The community that you were cultivating was so precious and beautiful. And so anytime you want me to come back, I will come back because I just, I mean, that's what we're missing. We're missing discipleship. We're missing walking alongside people. We're missing loving people well. We're, mi I mean, and your girls asked some questions. I mean, they were like, they got after it. And I think when it's not surface level and we're actually going mm -hmm. deep, uh, man, transformation can really take place. So thank you. But thank you, ladies, for what you're doing in those in that mastermind group. Oh, thanks, yeah, it was so, so good. It was so good, even though my audio was not when I was you were I was supposed to like play music on cue and it wasn't. Anyways, it was still beautiful. OK, moving on. Tell us about the audio book and tell us I want you to say what you said before we hit record, because sure. I've also read this in your newsletter and and how you specifically prayed for this and why it's so special yes. and important to you. Tell us. Yeah. Yeah. Friends. And Chrissy, you, you kind of know this, like the, the publishing world is, a, it's different for everyone, but there is sort of like a rhythm that people have and it's, you get the written book contract and then you get an audio contract. And for whatever reason, I did not get the audio contract when the book launched. And so now we are a year later and the audio book is coming out. And I just, I, that's because, sorry to interrupt you, but everyone realized what an amazing book it is and that it needs the audio. Yeah, oh, thank you. That is very kind. But I did this weird thing where I had 10 purple balloons and these 10 purple balloons represented a specific prayer that I prayed for this book. And some of them are like crazy prayers. I don't know if you've ever uh, read the book by Mark Batterson, Draw the Circle, but yes. they're just like, what are your audacious prayers that you're praying for? Some of them, like I'm embarrassed to even say, but when they happen, I can't wait to like say, I prayed for this, you know? But one of them specifically was that I would get the audio contract and I would be able to narrate it. So what I've been told is first time book authors, especially if they're not like bestsellers or whatever, your chance of actually narrating the book isn't isn't great. So not only did I get the audio contract, but I got to narrate it myself. And the crazy part is, for whatever reason, God chose for it to happen in New York City. 
And so 20 years ago, I lived in New York because I wanted to make it big. I wanted to be famous. I wanted to live my life of um, just, I thought fame was where it was all going to be at. And I was a musical theater major. And so to go back there, you guys, 20 years later, as a new creation in Christ, somebody completely different where I was absolutely, I don't care about being famous anymore. I care about doing what God has called me to do. So to be there and and experience that 20 years later differently for a project that the Lord has given me was just this wild, like, I can't believe I'm here, you know, like pinch yourself mm -hmm. kind of moment, but also mm -hmm. like, wow, this is so neat. So yes, uh, the, the audio launches June 25th and I cannot wait because I feel like people that suffer with anxiety and depression, they don't have a lot of margin to sit down and read a book, but they'll pop open an audiobook while they're driving or while they're walking or while they're working out. So I just think it's just this whole new opportunity for people to reach the content, to be connected to the content. Yeah, that's so good. I listen to literally everything. And then if I feel like I need to buy it to also highlight it in it, I do that. But I listen to everything because wow. it's, as you said, you can take it on the go and in the traffic when you're sitting in traffic and all that stuff. Yeah. So this is so exciting, babe. So, so exciting. Yay. Thanks for celebrating with me, ladies. And thanks for having me back. I appreciate it so much. Yeah, and, of course. And also, I love just how much more accessible it will be because um, you said like for the people that suffer with like, you know, fear and anxiety and depression, you know, um, I mean, really, who doesn't? To some degree, who doesn't? It is something yeah. that it doesn't take much to look out the window in the world or look on the news and turn on the social media and see that like we live in a very a world that does not lend itself to overcoming fear and anxiety very well mm -hmm. or living a life without that. And so I just think it's such a blessing to have to keep having this conversation too, how you can break through some of those obstacles, especially like with our youth. That's something that we all it's all near and dear to our hearts as moms of teenagers. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really grateful that you said that because for two, two reasons, I think a lot of people feel like we can only address fear and anxiety when it gets to the point of suicide or self-harm yeah. or wherever it is. But it's like, what would it look like if we could be re we could be proactive instead of reactive? What would it look like if we knew the smoke alarms in our children and in ourselves as parents and we were serious about that instead of just brushing it under the rug. Oh, everyone's busy. Everyone's anxious. Everybody's depressed. Everybody has stress in their life. But what if we like took Jesus's word seriously and he was like, yeah. I've come to give you peace, but we don't, we ignore it and we keep rolling and we keep going. And so I, I think the cool part about the content of my book is even though I had a nervous breakdown, even though I was diagnosed with severe panic and anxiety disorder and I was hospitalized and I had suicidal thoughts and it was the darkest, deepest, most horrific time of my life. I also walk you through other parts of my journey where I'm much more healed, but still have setbacks and still have what I call aftershocks. And so it's relatable on both sides. It's relatable for the person that is just like, man, I know that I'm a little anxious right now and I need some help. And then it's relatable for the person that's like, I've been to the hospital several times and I can't get control of this anxiety. Yeah. It's very similar, like when you just said that too, to alcohol, right? It's like, it doesn't, why do we wait for it to, to some, for someone to get, have a DUI or for your marriage to break up or something horrible to happen? when this can all be looked at so much earlier. Yeah, it's the same. That, that is such a great point because I think anxiety is a symptom of something else deeper going on. You know, running to alcohol is an, a, a symptom of something else going on. So I think just this this awareness of like, why are we all so stressed out? Why yeah. are we all so depressed? Why are we yeah. all so anxious? Like, let's let's have some like mastermind conversations about about this in community. Totally. I couldn't agree with you more, Chrissy. Yeah. I mean, this is like a, probably a whole nother three part if Mead had her way episode, but why, why are we all so stressed out? <laughs> I think we have to look at it from our age groups because yeah. there's a lot going on in different stages. Um, if we want to focus on youth, I highly, highly, highly recommend that everybody goes and reads the book, The Anxious Generation. Mm. It's just coming out. It's a, He's a sociologist, and he actually um, does not believe in God. But 
What's amazing is he has done some studies. The whole premise of the book is talking about how social media and technology is ruining, literally ruining our youth, our younger generation. And he has clear statistics that show that when the smartphone released in 2012 or whatever, the the amount of mental health problems and concerns, self-harm, depression, anxiety, and suicide went just like completely yeah. Yeah. like through the roof. And our age group has we we've dealt with it, but we didn't grow up on it in adolescence. And there's yeah. this 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 stage that we should not be introduced to these types of things until our brains and our adult until we become into adults. And so I think for our youth, it's we've got to get a hold of the problem that's going on with smartphones, smartphone use, social media, technology on both sides. For our generation, it is the hustle culture. It's the keep going, be successful, no matter what it costs you. Yeah. And I think there, there's so much underneath all of that. And then we've got the clash of both generations coming yeah. together. You know, the parents of of our saying, get yourself together. We're, you know, and then that's just making this chaos in our teenagers and this youth group. So it's this perfect storm of nonsense that we need to get a hold of 100%. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, you basically just described. So I'm in the UK for those don't don't remember that. And I'm our our kids are not off for school yet, but they had this week off for half term. And the amount of the it's the you guys, I hope that Ella doesn't listen to this. I don't think she will. It's the only thing that Ella and I, who's 14, fight about. It's it's the only thing that we literally argue about. Like we are very, very close. I adore her. She's like my little bestie, but if I say the word just say the word phone. The other day I just said, you've been on your phone. And like, I didn't even, <laughs> didn't even didn't finish even the it sentence. Out. And it's World War Three, And I find it so hard. But I also know that I'm on mine too much. And I use it a lot for work, right? Like I'm messaging clients. I'm on Instagram. I'm That's where my clients find me, all of this stuff. So I know truly that I'm not like modeling the behavior either. But at the same time, as you said, like their brains are literally being formed. And of course, then it's always the, well, so-and-so gets to do this and da 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 and all the comparison. But it is, I just think that I'm glad we're acknowledging it because in my house, it's it's the only thing I fight about with Ella. And it's one of the few things I fight about with Carter, too. It's so hard. Well, well one of the things that I've been really reflecting on uh, is we, with this book and just the work that I'm doing in the community, I have this crazy passion for this next generation to help them. And one of the things I just keep hearing the Holy Spirit say to me is, you're distracted. You're distracted. Yeah. You're distracted. And I believe we really have a mental health crisis in our world today because we have a discipleship crisis. And so what would it look like if we could, as this generation, pour into the next generation? And and so parents had the realization, student, you know, student leaders, teachers, pastors, principals, all everybody that's pouring into this next generation, whether it be from a Christian standpoint or not, we all rise up collectively and say, hey, we know what social media is doing to these young brains. Yeah. And so we are going to protect that at all costs. So I think about how if somebody said to you, if you use this toy, 5% mm -hmm. of the people that use this toy are going to develop depression, anxiety, or suicidal thoughts, or self-harm. 5%. If, if I give you this toy to your kid, 5% are going to, we would be like, I'm not taking that chance, right? Yeah. Like, I'm not going to yeah. let them have this toy. But we do it with smartphones. And, and so it's like, I, I think we all had good intentions. No parent or teacher or pastor or nobody is like, oh, let's give somebody something that's going to hurt them, right? But now that the statistics are out, the science is out, the data is out, this is dangerous and it is causing horrible effects on our youth. Let's all say collectively, let's do something about it. It looks like maybe we have, you know, youth groups that are cell phone free. It's school that says we all agree that eight hours without your cell phone is healthy and good. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. It's parents coming together. Maybe... 
maybe you go to your coach or your cheer, you know, cheer coach and you're like, hey, what can we do about this mental health epidemic? What if all of us parents say, hey, before the age of 16, we're not going to allow our kids to have Instagram because mm-hmm. we know the effects of what that's going to do. It was collectively we got, all got into the problem together. And now collectively we all got to get out of the problem together. And I think it's going to be conversation. It's going to be talking about what can we all do together? Because when you're the Lone Ranger and you're the only mom that yep. says no snap or you're the only mom that says no Instagram or dad or whoever, it's going to make the problem worse. It's going to make well, the I'm apparently, I am apparently the only mom in the entire world, you guys, that does not allow TikTok. <laughs> no, you're not because... We don't either in our home yeah, or unless you're 16. But your kid is not in community with my kid. We need to get in with the kids that we're in mm-hmm. community with. It's like, hey, have them over for dinner and say, can we talk about this? And if, if us six stand together, then we at least we know that, you know, this friend group is going to say no to this. And so it's just more conversations, more. And, and I know how devastating the effects of mental health are. I could not mm-hmm. imagine. I mean, I went through a nervous breakdown when I was in my late twenties. I'm an adult. My brain is formed at this point. But if I had to go through this when I was 12, 13, oh 14, my gosh. I mean, yeah. I could, I cannot imagine. And so it's like, what can we do now to start collectively helping as yeah. we're all out with this? I am so glad we're having this conversation because this is something that I think is long overdue and people don't want to have a conversation about because not unlike when you're stuck on the drinking cycle, it's like if I bring awareness to this, if I actually acknowledge this, then I have to do something about it. And that's going to require effort, that's going to require action. And that's the hard part when we're we're more already as parents, uh, you know, feeling exhausted by all of the other things. And it's like, and now I have to fight this thing too. But it's so necessary. I mean, the studies show that the cell phone use, social media use, it does the same thing to our brains that alcohol use over time does. It shrinks, it shrinks our brains. And so, yeah, having these having these conversations about it and coming together collectively, what would be a, a good next step for the listener who's like, yes, this is something I'm passionate about too. And what can I do? What's like one little small change I could make to address this? I think for me with, with my family, it's like, where do I have the most impact? So, mm. at, you know, as a parent, where's my child spending the most time? If it is on a chair or it's the football field or it's the basketball court, or maybe, maybe for it is school. Maybe that's where it's like, what administrator or what coach or what person could you go and have a conversation with? And maybe it's just the group that your, your, your kids hang out with. What if you had five parents over and you pulled up a few statistics and said, look, I'm, I'm scared that if we don't get a hold of this, our children are going to have massive mental health. Now here's one thing the, the, uh, this is really a cool thing. They're finding that religion or Christianity, somebody that is tied to a, a deep roots like their 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 faith in Jesus, they are less likely to be impacted by the mental health problem with social media use. So that's good news. Being connected to a community of believers yes. that can help you in what it's discipleship, walking alongside. So. W- I think it's like a two-part situation. It's like as this data is coming out and it's like making us go, oh my gosh, the good news is, is Jesus is the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, community Mm -hmm. is the answer. Discipleship is the answer. So it's like, you can be an incredible witness by saying, hey, look at what the world is doing to our children. And look, you know, Jesus offers something so different. And so, I don't know, I just think take one small step. And I know that you guys coach that too, to get Mm -hmm. unstuck. It's like, what's the one step you can take? And I think, okay, I have a little tip here. There's five questions that I like to ask myself or somebody else Mm -hmm. that is dealing with anxiety. And I'm sure if you're stuck in alcohol loop, this could, these five questions could be really helpful too. My counselor gave me these questions, but now I, I use them everywhere. So the first one was, what is specifically the problem? And you might be like, seriously, that's the first question. But 
so many of us don't even know what the problem is. Yeah. Like yeah. There, our kids are coming home and they're isolating or they're like screaming at you in rage. And you're like, where is this rage is coming from? Or you yourself are screaming at your own children at rage. And, and we, and it's like, there's this problem loop going on, but nobody's stopping to say, mm-hmm. what specifically is the problem here? Okay. Yeah. I'm anxious because I'm worried about my children or I'm anxious because I have years of unresolved pain that I haven't processed because I, you know, lived in a home without a father or it, it's like, these are deep things that are causing so much more to take place. So what specifically is the problem? Because generally when you're screaming at someone at that moment, that's not the actual problem. There's right. something else underneath that is the problem. Okay. So then the next question is what part of this can I control? What part of this can I control? And here's the thing. Nine times out of 10, we are anxious and worried and stressed out over something that we really have no control over. Mm -hmm. Control is this shiny object that we all run after and we think it brings us peace, but in return, it actually gives us a false sense of peace and security. So identifying what part of this can I control? Then the next question is, what part of this can I not control? That's Mm -hmm. just as important. If someone, let's say your kid is being bullied at school, right? Well, can you really control this bully? You absolutely cannot. Yeah. You are in control of your response. Mm-hmm. You're in control of how you pray for that person. You're in control of how you advocate for your child. But like so often we're like, well, we're going to go beat that kid up or I'm going to tell that kid. And we try to take control of a situation we really don't have control over. So what part of this can I not control? So knowing what you can and cannot control is so important. And then this one, oh man, it's a good one. If this is a problem I can solve, what am I gonna do about it? Because a lot of times we can identify mm-hmm. the problem and we, we we know what we control, but we don't wanna do anything about it and we stay yeah. stuck. So we're like, yeah. I don't wanna have the hard conversation. Yeah. I don't want to leave this job because I care more about the material things of life rather than whatever. Or I don't want to have this hard conversation because I'm afraid I might lose my job. Or I don't want to have this hard conversation because I'm afraid that I might lose this friendship. Or, you know, I don't want to stop using my credit card because whatever, you know, it's like if it's a problem I can't solve, what am I going to do about it? And then it's if this is a problem and I want to solve it then it's like, take the action steps, do it, do something about it. We stay stuck in anxiety loops and chaos loops mm-hmm. and they function to, because we just are unwilling to do anything about it. And sometimes it means you go see a counselor. Sometimes it means you talk to a godly friend. Sometimes it means you just need to get with God in your journal and ask him what to do next. I love the book of James talking about ask for wisdom and he's going to give it to you generously. We don't realize how we can get the help we need if we'll just ask for the help. So anyway, those are some questions I like to work through when I'm dealing with stuff. And they're great for teenagers too. When you're talking about youth and this next generation, it's getting clear on what the problem is and doing something about it. Responding to the heartfelt requests from you, our wonderful, wonderful listeners for a deeper sense of community. We are so excited to introduce y'all to the But Jesus Drink Wine community. Get ready to be part of an exclusive experience where you'll join a sisterhood of kindred spirits on a transformative journey of faith, sobriety, and personal growth. You'll gain access to our private community, a place where deep connections can flourish among women who share your aspirations of strengthening faith in Christ and breaking free from alcohol. But wait, there's more. We'll host regular connection calls to facilitate fellowship with like-minded gals No matter where you stand on your alcohol or faith journey, whether you're seasoned or just curious, you are very warmly welcomed here. Prepare to be inspired by guest expert sessions and engaging Q&As that explore the essential topics for your sobriety, faith, and holistic wellness journey. Don't miss out on securing your spot. Click the link in the show notes to learn more. We can't wait to see your beautiful face in the But Jesus Drank Wine community. I love that so much, babe. So how do you talk to teenagers without them realizing (laughs) that you're trying to coach them, (laughs) not coach them, but you know, like sometimes, and me and I have had this conversation before too. It's like, we're, we're desperate to help and we're desperate to like walk them through these kind of things. But the second they spot like a, 
I don't know. I don't know. How do you talk to them? How do you do this? Chrissy, it's such a good question. And honestly, I like to go back to just the greatest teacher and master of all time, which was Jesus. And he asked questions. Mm -hmm. And so when you are dealing with teenagers, whether it's parenting or just you're pouring into this generation, they're in this stage of independence. They they want to do what they want to do. They want to have freedom. They want to think for themselves, especially Gen Z. I mean, they are just like, don't you dare talk for me. Don't you think for me, da, 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 da. So it's more of like questions like, well, how does that make you feel? Or, you know, not open-ended questions. Like, how was your day? Fine. Yeah. It's more of like, what was something that was hard for you today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, if you could, if you could tell me right now, uh, uh, what emotion you're feeling, would it be anxious, sad, depressed, like get, you know, and then you move on from there. It's like, You've moved into, instead of like telling them what to do, it's more of a coaching role. It's like you're helping them figure out what they need. But the problem is I can't do that when I'm unhealthy myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think parents have to get real with where they're at and how they're, you, you know, you mentioned yeah. modeling the same behavior. I mean, I'm just as bad with my phone 90% of the time too. So it's like, I got to get, if I want my kids to stop being on their cell phones that I need to, I need to model that as well. So I, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's a lot more question asking than it is telling them this is because you're right. They'll sniff that out. As soon as they think you're telling them what to do or telling them how to think it just, it, it's like defense city comes up, yeah. you know? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, that's so good, babe. I mean, just last night I was asking my son, I said, hey, bud, how do you feel like you're doing on your screen time? Yeah. What did he and say? He just, well, he's like, I think okay. Really? Okay, what 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 does okay look like for you? And, you know, we talked it through. And it was like, what what is a goal for you? What would you love your screen time goal to be? You know, like, I want it to be two hours or less, right? But, like, what does he want his screen time goal to be? And that gets in their head. Like I love you, that. Then you get to find out, like, what what do they want for their lives, you know? Often, like, even my middle son, when he's starting to feel a little anxious or a little off, he's had way too much screen time. Yeah. And so I'm able to kind of say, like, hey, is there any correlation between you feeling kind of yes. anxious? And they'll be like, oh, I had this, like, stupid Snapchat situation that took place and da-da-da-da. I'm like, can you see now how that's impacting your soul? Yeah, mom, I can see that now, you know, kind of thing. So it's just kind of like instead of telling them this is going to make you anxious or depressed, it's guiding them along and, and showing them how and why. Yeah, I love that so much. I love that so much. It's so hard. It's it's very difficult to model, but it's so important. It's so important. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. A lot of the times I'm just like, I'm trying to text a client or I'm like booking a podcast. Yes, I'm not scrolling on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, but and, and you feel like you have to justify it. And so often what I'll do with my kids on that part, I'll be like, hey, I want you all to know that my phone is off how I get a lot of office work done. Mm -hmm. So I try to create spaces in my home that are my office. So right now I'm in my podcasting room. They know that when I'm in here, I'm working. And then I have a little area that's more, everybody can see it, but it's like my office desk. What I, they know that when I'm sitting there, I'm working. So the problem with our technology is we'll work in bed, we'll work in, yep. we'll work yep. in the kitchen, we'll work everywhere. So if you can just create mm -hmm. spaces in your home that are work spaces then they'll know, okay, mom is working and they won't, they won't equate that to Instagram scrolling or whatever it might be. And so I try to be intentional about that. And then we, we try to have spaces that are just no technology zones, dinner table. I yeah. like to do the car sometimes, but I'll announce it. I'll say, Hey, can we all put our cell phones away and just have a conversation, you know? And then there are times where they can be on their cell phones in the car or whatever. But I think it's just that communicating to what what you're hoping to achieve instead of just telling them this is how it's going to be seems to go a lot further. Now, I'm not perfect at this. There'll be times where I'll be like, put your phone away, you know, and I'm not kind about it. But I mean, I think it's just it's important to communicate. 
Yeah, when you said the thing about the cars, I was just thinking, I always feel like I'm an Uber driver when I like everybody piles in and they like open up their Snapchat and I'm like, I am not an Uber driver. I am your mother. Talk to me. <laughs> Put yeah. the phone down. <laughs> well, and then I think, so those are the moments where it's just like you get in the car and you say, hey guys, I would really love to have a conversation with you. Is it okay if we take the next 20 minutes to talk and we put the phones down? And a lot of times they're like, sure, fine. But because we're so accustomed to just numbing out to the phone, be thinking about conversations you want to have in the car with your kids. You know, like pre-think about 10 questions you want to kind of lock and load because then it won't be awkward, weird pauses. And the first couple of questions, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But like as you get going, you'll you'll see that they're opening up and they really do crave time with us. They crave mm -hmm. conversation with us. They want to tell us things, but these phones have got us locked into just not communicating and not talking. Yeah. There's so many statistics about Gen Z not being as hooked on alcohol as like our generations, but I really do believe it is because they have a phone in their face all the time. Because mm -hmm. if you think about the reasons that we drink, like if we just list a few of them of like connection or, you know, entertainment to be more fun or socialize or cope with even cope, right? It's they actually they actually do all that by looking at a screen, right? And you want to chat with a friend. You want to distract yourself. You want to numb out. Like it's all screen. And so I think this is Obviously, like, as we said, going to be the big the issue for like all of our children's generation. And but this is also why it's probably not alcohol. Yeah. Wow. You just like rocked my socks thinking about that, because I mean, I I don't want people to run to alcohol. Right. I, I yeah. don't think that that's better. And science is showing that the phones are just as bad. And that that should be a wake up call to all mm -hmm. of us. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's just like alcohol that was sold for so long. It's just like it's this benign magic elixir. You know, like it. it's not like nobody was talking about that it's a class one carcinogen. It's like it's dressed up as this benign thing, just like our technology is dressed up as this thing for convenience and something that makes helps us. Social media helps us stay connected. But when I was a regular social media user, I was never more disconnected and feeling alone, which was kind of like my first little breakup when before getting into the uh, breaking up with with alcohol. But I, I think, that, you know, so much of it, it's easy to also like fall into the like, oh, my gosh, not like I kind of said from the start, like now I have this awareness for this, but then I'm also feeling overwhelmed. Like, what do I do about it? And that's where I would also encourage Melissa and Christy. I mean, you, you would probably say the same thing. It's like it doesn't change doesn't have to happen on a big scale and it doesn't have to happen abruptly just by having asking your kids questions and starting these conversations. And you gave so many good ideas for for joining in community and, and how can we kind of like band together because um, because it is it is a big deal. You just made me think of something wild, but OK, we're so used oh. to seeing the major followers, the huge platforms, all the big stuff, the big influencers, the YouTubers, and we think that's the way the world gets changed, right? Mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. But really, if we go back to scripture, we look about how Christianity spread. It spread yeah. through 12 disciples, right? And it just yeah. was the biggest. So it's like, go impact 12 people. Go impact mm -hmm. one person. Start in your home yeah. and let that ripple effect over years of discipleship and loving people and pouring into people. And like, it will make a difference. And I think we just are accustomed to this, like, it has to be big and has to have a ton mm -hmm. of followers and everything. I mean, mm -hmm. and it's just simply, it's a lie that we've all bought into. I mean, I had a quick question for you as you were talking. You said, um, you, you so you're not on social media very much anymore, right? Like it's kind of a, did you break up with social media first or alcohol first? I was just curious. Social media. But it wasn't like a big breakup situation. I just started paying. I, I was like, do I feel better when I use this or do I not? I just got curious. And it's the same thing that eventually, you know, I kind of did with alcohol. But it was something where I was just noticing that I was not – that I was sitting there on my social media while my little kids were, I'm like, you know, go play. Not unlike how eventually I was with, uh, you know, wine or whatever. So it's so interesting to me to see how the parallels are. And I also think it creates this opportunity as well 
for, you know, Jesus calls us to live differently. I, I think living free from alcohol and being a non-drinker in an alcohol saturated world is a, a way of live, living differently. I also see it as an opportunity for our teens to live differently as well and kind of gain it's it's so much it's so much bigger than just, you know, the one little thing to to live differently. It is going to impact yeah. That's so interesting to me. Like it 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 truly is because I feel the same way. I started getting curious too. Like, mm-hmm. am I going to feel better if I just take some time off? And inevitably, mm-hmm. if I would just take 30 days, 40 days, if I would just take, and I felt so much better not being on social media. And I imagine your community says the same thing when they stop drinking, right? Like you just, you, you mm-hmm. think you need it. You think yeah. you need it to be able to survive or to get through or to cope or whatever it is. And I know for me, it is so easy to open up my phone and numb out and just look at other people's drama and other people's things. But then the other thing I think about too, and I'd be interesting to parallel this to alcohol, but like, and maybe why social media is worse or just phones in general is, you know, there is so much science behind the fact that we were built for community, but Mm -hmm. really the human cannot do more than about a hundred relationships, right? And so if you that are on like Facebook, a lot of relationships, I was just thinking about like a hundred. <laughs> well, I mean, think about your yeah. school line and your, your, you know, these aren't deep relations. Inner yeah, circles yeah, yeah. are like two to three. And then you've got your 12 and then your 72 and then your multitudes. Right. But like, that's about a hundred people in your, you know, scope and things used to be like community. Like you had yeah. a community grocery store, you had a community bank, you had a like, and everything was all kind of together and you knew those people and you did yes. life with those people and you knew them by name, but not, and, and, and then when they were going through something hard, you, you would go through it with them. But now, you know, if you've got 4,000 friends on Facebook and you might see a thousand of the heartache and horrible things that they're going through. Every time my mind saw that process, that Mm -hmm. it impacted my heart, it impacted my soul. And so I don't have capacity. Yeah. My soul doesn't have capacity for all that negativity, for all that trauma, for all that. But, but yet we take it in every single day and part of the reason why I felt better is because medical stuff totally pings my anxiety. So I would see somebody, you know, just diagnosed with cancer and then I'd be like, oh my gosh, is that going to happen to me? And then, yeah. you know, and and, yeah. and it would just, or something would happen to uh, somebody's child. I'm like, oh my gosh, is that going to happen to me? You know, and it's like the enemy just knew how to get a hold of my thoughts. And so if it's like, the guard your heart kind of thing. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful what a, that that a old song that people would s- sing because I think it's so important that we do guard our hearts. Not only what we ingest or put into our bodies, but also what we see and what we hear. I think it's it's so darn important, especially if we want to kick this anxiety, depression, stressed out culture that we're living in. Yeah, it just it makes me. Oh, well, this is a whole sidebar, but. For those that don't know, Christy and I share a literary agent and our agent is a very big proponent for the way that the publishing industry glorifies Instagram and social media numbers is wrong. But I don't know about you, Christy, but when I was sending out my, you know, my my proposal, my pitches, like I got so many back that basically said your following isn't big enough. Right. And it's like this is this is the culture that we're supposed to be. This is the, the reason that, like, I get nervous to, like take the full break is because we feel like it has to be as ministry leaders, as podcast hosts, whatever, as coaches that like, can we actually disconnect? I've done something that's helped me a little bit. And that is that I have a personal account and I have my my love life sober, my like work account essentially. And I can see the shift if I, if I do log into the personal because I'm comparing vacations and I'm comparing furniture and I'm comparing kids cute clothes and all that stuff and so I can feel it when I'm on that page and so I try to stay off that as much as possible and stick to my like work page but even that right it's like it's this this society even even with what we're doing which is trying to help people and I truly believe that that I truly believe what you said like when we had um recently we called we asked you know our community just Anybody that wants to come on, we're just going to have a panel and we're going to hit record for the podcast. And 
we're going to just talk about what we're doing. And we didn't think anybody was going to turn up. And all these gals came and they were talking about how beautiful it is. And Mead and I were snot crying because we were just so overwhelmed. And I said to Mead in a Voxer after, I was like, even if it doesn't grow, like even if it's just these gals that we have, not only is this is, is this enough, but this is such a blessing. Mm. And and that for me, even saying it out loud was like, who am I and what am I saying? Right? <laughs> because, because we're so taught that it's like, fill, fill the auditoriums, get the numbers up, people, 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 more, 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 book sales, book sales, book sales. And it's like, even, even if it's one, right? You know, am I making any sense? I'm I'm so glad that you shared that, Christy, because, you know, Fearless Unite, the the nonprofit that I run, it went from thousands of people coming to our meetings to now I am discipling 10 girls in my home every week and nobody mm-hmm. knows about it. Like we just started going public with the fact that I'm discipling some girls so that they can turn around and go disciple more. Yes. And it is the 10. It that's that yes. that is the priority in my life right now is these women because I know that if their soul gets changed and their yep. life gets changed, then they can turn right back around and do it for someone else. Yes. And there is room for conferences, there is room for teaching, there's room for big events, but the transformation happens when you're shoulder to shoulder. The transformation happens when you can open up the Bible together and go, I do not understand this, What help me understand it. The transformation happens when snot bubbles are coming out and you're able to like talk to one another with it. And and so I don't know, I, I think Mary is doing phenomenal work, our, our agent at just talking about this, saying, yeah. hey, why are we only publishing the people that have 100,000 you know, or more? Like, there are people that have things to say that we can take a chance on. And I'm so thankful that my publishing company took a chance on me because I didn't have those followers. And I turned out, you know, because God was behind it, it was a successful endeavor, right? I think just how do we measure obedience and yeah. success is really important too. You know, I think in, <laughs> in the book of Kings, it talks about how Success is measured by obedience to God, but the world measures success by numbers, favors, followers, you know, wealth, all that stuff. And it's like, so what gives here? You know, Christy, Mm -hmm. if you wouldn't have gotten your contract and you would have self-published and sold maybe a hundred books, those hundred people's lives matter and it, it, it it makes a difference. So I don't know. I, I struggle with all of the same things you struggle with too. And I love, I love that you've got the two accounts and, and all that stuff. I've started to have somebody volunteer on the pers- are on the um, ministry side of it, you know, cr- putting the content out just so that I don't have to deal with it. But honestly, our socials are dead and I'm trying to figure out, maybe God's just saying, are you done yet? Like, it's time to just get off, <laughs> yeah. you know, like yeah. what you're doing face to face with people. And honestly, you know, what's weird. My email open rate is crazy. Like that, if you had a worldly measurement, like that would be yeah, like, but whoa, because that's... you have really good emails. Well, thank you. I always read your, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm one but of it's, them. <laughs> it's because I'm trying to just it's not curated. It's what has happened in my week or life this week. Like, this is what I'm learning right now yes. and I want to share it with you. And yes. it's just, I, I feel like I I think about the woman on the other side or even the man on the other side. I'm like, how could this help you today? And I feel like when we serve people out of a place of loving them and helping them where they're at right now, then that is what, that's what people need right now. They don't need yeah. another beautiful curated fluffy post I mean there's a million of them out there and quite frankly it overwhelms me it overwhelms me but then it's the same thing like don't get completely off of it either because we still need good voices and good things it's just it's the just don't let it overtake your life right so so good can you well well, let's do tiny tina first what is (laughs) what's your tiny new action for our listeners okay So the tiny thing that I'm showing up for right now is stillness. Mm -hmm. Preach. It's it's stillness. It's, it's so this morning before I got on with you all, I wrapped up in a blanket with my hot tea and I went out on my deck and I sat there and I just, I, it's, I wouldn't even say that I prayed. It was just the like stillness of, Mm -hmm. at first it was a little bit chaotic in my mind with thoughts, but then it was like. It naturally just moved to gratitude 
And then it was just like, man, this feels good to just sit and be still yeah. and settle my mind and just calm the chaos. So that's my tiny Tina right now. Stillness. I love it nice so, day. so much. Yeah. So good. Tell everybody where to find you and we will link the book in the show notes and everything, but tell the people where they can find you. Well, friends, I am trying to do less social media. <laughs> I am on Instagram, Christian Bulwer, Fearless Unites on Instagram. But really, if you want to get connected, just get to those daily, those weekly emails. Go to christybulwer.com and you'll see a box that says get anxiety tips. And if you click that and sign up for that, you'll get a weekly email from me where I do. I walk you through anxiety tips. It's a it's a great place to be. But I would love for you to get the audio book. The audio book mm -hmm. will be on audio, uh, audio.com, but Audible. Audible is the main place to go get it. And yeah, that'll be on June 25th. And it's called Nervous Breakthrough, Finding Freedom from Fear and Anxiety in a World that Feeds It. Yes. So good. So true. <laughs> I wish Thanks. it wasn't. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Christy. Thank, Thank you, you, Christy. Love this you, girls. Was amazing. Love Same. you. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. You can find all of our episodes at butjesusdrinkwine.com and be sure to follow us over on Instagram, Love Life Sober, and I'm Not Sober, I'm Free. To learn more about what we do, you can visit our websites, meetholandshirley.com and lovelifesober.com. Take a screenshot of this podcast and share it with a friend or two. And don't forget to subscribe to our pod so you don't have to worry about missing a single episode. And if you love what we're doing, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify. This helps more women who are feeling stuck and alone in the overdrinking cycle find hope and encouragement. Thanks, ladies. We so appreciate you. And we'll see you next Monday. Monday.